83 weeks, five days, 586 days, 14,064 hours, 843,840 minutes, 50,630,400 seconds. That's how old Verdant score, at least some iteration of it, is. Introduced as the game-changing map within Modern Warfare 2019, Verdansk has seen the good and bad and been with us the entire step of Warzone's life cycle. In just over 40 days, however, pending no delays or alterations to the timing of Season 1 of Vanguard, that will no longer be the case in Verdansk as we know it. Actually, scratch that. Verdansk as a whole will be gone forever. From there, our journey goes to the Pacific, where we'll have our first brand new map, no alteration, no time warp of the city, nothing of the sorts, but instead, a brand new world and landscape to learn, fight, and survive in. Until then, our time in Verdansk is dwindling, so this is the complete evolution of Verdansk. Verdansk's first introduction actually comes much earlier than what we saw with Warzone's launch in March of this last year. Verdansk's initial playable introduction was all the way back at the launch of Modern Warfare, and in two places actually. For the story nerds like myself, the lore and story, that progression in Verdansk started with the first playable mission, Fog of War, just after the initial title sequence with a pan out over the woods and the bolded name front and center of Verdansk. Echo 3-1, or Alex and his team, are en route for an op just outside of Verdansk in the country of Kastovia, a fictional country situated in between the Russian Federation and Georgia, when we learn of our baddie for the campaign, General Barkov, and the Russians being on site. Without any spoilers, this sets up the story we see unfold in Modern Warfare, and additionally, the chance to revisit Verdansk later down the road. But also at launch, for those that were quick to finish the campaign, we learned that, that story actually continues in Spec Ops, with a cutscene with Russian forces being overrun by Alcatala taking the city, and the rest of the missions to come focused in the actual city centers and surrounding areas of Verdansk. Outside of Ground War maps, this was the first true playable experience that we had in the world of Verdansk, and later we'd come to find out of Warzone. I still remember being in the pre-release capture event the week before getting footage of Spec Ops and over a PlayStation party comms, chatting with a PR member from the COD team in my party saying, man, this is a whole world. This sure would make a great Battle Royale map, and the whole dodging of the I have no idea what you're talking about replies if we both knew that myself and the rest of my party were onto something. Buggy, incredibly tough for casuals at times, and not everyone's cup of tea, Spec Ops may not have been your first experience of Verdansk, that very likely could have come a few months later then, with the full launch of Warzone. March 10th, 2020. To me, this is a date that changes Call of Duty forever. The introduction of Warzone. The first double down on a free-to-play aspect of a Call of Duty game, a sentence that a year before would have been almost inconceivable. Free in Call of Duty. Verdansk was released to the world, however, setting the groundwork and fundamentals for what we'd see for the next, well, over year and a half to come in some capacity or another. For those who were eagle-eyed, that had thought the Spec Ops and Ground War maps would turn into something else, for those that free camera out of maps like Superstore to see the world at large, it was finally here. There was no conspiracy any longer, it was genuinely here. Verdansk was introduced with a handful of different named points of interest, dam, military base, quarry, airport, TV station, storage town, super Superstore, Stadium, Lumber, Boneyard, Train Station, Hospital, Downtown, Farmland, Promenade, West and East, Hills, Park, Port, and Prison, with so many subsidiary locations in between. Things like Hangars, Block, Circus, Rivertown, City Apartments, and many, many like it. Along with all the way the map played and locations to visit, we saw the groundwork for Easter eggs far out to come with things like the bunkers, which wouldn't be opened for a little while, the telephones and the laptops scattered around the map, some of which never even had a purpose in Verdansk, surprisingly. But all introduced. Season 2 and the introduction of Verdansk was just the initial offering, and it was all brand new to us. There was tons to explore, tons to learn, and tons to even master if you were to go a step further. This was Warzone. Modern Warfare Season 3 introduced the first major change to Verdansk in Warzone, the largest of that being the changeover from a dormant bunker system to an active one. No points of interest were added within Season 3 of Modern Warfare to Verdansk or Warzone, but the basic building blocks that we saw with the initial launch of Verdansk was what was expanded upon. In various caches and loot boxes, players were able to find these brand new red access cards that allowed you to go into any of the bunkers that were connected directly to the outside. That meant the ones on the cliffside, 
besides the ones in plain view, but not the ones in any sort of underground bunkers. Those remained locked, some for more particular reasons and until much later on. But for those that found these red access cards, you could go to one of these bunkers and if in your inventory, you were able to open them up and go into the sort of holding rooms of these bunkers where there was plenty of loot, legendary chests, score streaks, and all that could be yours for the taking. These bunkers and the chests in them were a great way to get a head start in either plunder or in battle royale. It just came down to where and how you chose to use them. Notably though, these bunkers, once you got inside them, there was another bunker door here that locked you off from seemingly going any further. Strangely, those were never expanded upon even though they had an input code and something that seemed like we'd have some more progress going towards them later on down the line. But also interesting with those bunkers that were accessible via red access cards, those were all the rage and they were all found out and explored within the first day or so. But those were somewhat of a decoy because there also was one particular bunker that deserved much more attention and after a bit of time in season three's launch, nothing crazy, just like a day or two after the launch of that season, that bunker code was cracked. Bunker 11, as it was previously known, was just north of Arklov military base and the fire station on its outskirts. Situated near the border of the playable map, there was a bunker that had a generator that had a red light above it. It had power like the rest that could be opened, but it didn't matter how many red access cards you had, you weren't getting into it. No, in fact, you actually were required to do an entire Easter egg to be able to get into it. The first of a few that we'd see throughout the history of Verdansk. The Bunker 11 Easter egg required you to activate a code sequence using the phones scattered around the map. Some phones were specific to starting that sequence, while others had individual numerical notations, but those numerical notations were denoted in Russian as the dialogue over the phone transmissions was from a Russian. Your goal? Find the three numerical notations in the activation sequence, fly to those associated telephones, interact with them in that specific order given and if done properly the red light above bunker 11 would turn green and you'd be able to open it up if not you'd have to start the entire sequence again this code sequence was tough to break for many because it's a randomized sequence that changed every single game so there was no mastering it and doing it quickly the only thing you could master was the phone's numerical denomination those in which phones were the activation phones were the only constants out of the whole thing but once you got inside you were rewarded quite a bit from an in-game loot perspective, you had the ability to access a ton of legendary crates, cash, and utility. From an Easter egg reward perspective, you were rewarded with the very first Easter egg blueprint reward that we'd seen in Warzone, the Mudge Robber MP7, an incredibly awesome looking blueprint. And finally, from a lore and story perspective, it really sowed the seeds of what was to come in Verdansk. From Cold War era bunkers to a nuclear warhead in the back that could only be seen by interacting with a certain part of the bunker, it foreshadowed what was to come. Season 4, while initially delayed, was something that it, on a map perspective, the evolution of an entire world didn't quite add to a whole ton that we may have considered or had hoped for, especially given a delay. Season 4 introduced Price and Gaz, two familiar faces and two fan favorites that we had seen introduced with Modern Warfare. It added intel missions to the overall Warzone experience, giving us that backstory to progress in the background on top of our plunder and battle royale gameplays. But in terms of actual map adjustments, this might have been one of the most dry seasons for map changes changes and additions. We saw that there were train tracks added, though interestingly at the time, no train was added on top of that. So we had the foundation for what would later be a train system within Verdansk, but up until that point, we were kind of like, well, why is this here? And the only other things added within Season 4 were goat trails that were added around the map in various locations that made it easier to traverse cliff sides. Up until this point, and even still to this day, there's a lot of locations within Verdansk that you probably get frustrated at when you try and climb some rocks that look very easy to climb over, but your super soldier can't do that. These being added in to try and mitigate some of the harsh cliff sides that were available in Verdansk at this point. But that was season four, a sort of lackluster season in terms of overall map changes. Now, as much as I want this to be an objective view back at Verdansk's history and evolution, the one piece of speculation that I want to add in here is that I really do wonder if some of this was meant to come in season four, because season five, by comparison to season four, was game changing. While it wasn't something that a couple of weeks after season five's launch, you were really too wowed with, 
In terms of sheer quantity of larger changes, it was night and day from Season 4 to Season 5. Season 5 introduced us to Shadow Company, but in the main cinematic sequence leading up to Season 5's launch, we end up seeing that Shadow Company actually blasts the roof open from Stadium just outside of downtown, this making it an entirely accessible area, whereas previously it was entirely walled off, you couldn't go into any of the parking structures, you couldn't go into any of the lower rotunda, nowhere. You could get on top of the Stadium roof, but that was about it. That made for almost an entire quadrant of the map being completely unusable because there was a giant building that you couldn't go through, couldn't go under, you could only go above if you had a helicopter. No other way up there. This changed play quite a bit, but also, that wasn't the only large location that we ended up seeing opened up. We also saw that Train Station was opened up just north of Promenade West and East. Again, another large structure that previously was entirely closed off and you had to go around, or in some cases you could get up on the roof and everything like that, but it offered up a lot more area of play. Something that adding in two larger additions like this, or rather, opening up of areas wasn't something that we'd seen before in Warzone for one singular season. It was kind of one of those things where it was one per season when you look at larger updates two seasons up until this point. But we also then saw that that train was added in as well, where the tracks the season before were added in, we now finally knew what that was for. A roaming train, which is just like the train in GTA, entirely indestructible. You can't stop it. It's an unstoppable force here at this. But on top of all three of those things, we saw once again another East egg added into Warzone and Verdansk, taking that main focal point of Stadium being opened up and then adding in an Easter egg to allow you to get a reward by gaining access to the main conference room. That Enigma CR56 AMAX blueprint still, I think, being one of the cleanest blueprints we had in Modern Warfare overall. Additionally, in Season 4, we also saw two secret rooms, or rather multiple secret rooms, opened up here. In accordance to what we'd end up seeing firstly with the Modern Warfare and Warzone storyline wrapping up in the following season, we saw some more teases here leading to where we'd eventually end up at. We saw a change to the ICBM bunker just south of downtown, right at the coastline there. You could actually go in and if you had the specified code, you could explore this bunker and also see that ICBM that again would be integral to the ending of Warzone and that narrative being told. But also on top of that, we saw a couple of different secret rooms opened up here throughout the course of the season that would eventually play into the Black Ops Cold War reveal which we'll talk about in just a second, but if you ended up having the denoted codes, you could end up opening up these areas and get a little bit of loot, but also find some clues and teasers for what was upcoming. If you did these at the very beginning, they would be super populated. Hopefully you found the lobbies where people weren't griefing and they'd be cool and just explore everything with you together harmlessly. Now, in terms of other map changes, there was some stuff that, functionally speaking, actually was pretty solid adjustments. We saw for the first time ascenders being added in to the taller locations of Redemption dance, allowing you to sort of combat rooftop campers. So if there were large buildings with only one or two ways up tight choke points of stairwells and things like that, you could end up taking that element of surprise perhaps and breaching from an entirely different location. This helped out greatly though, didn't quite get rid of the entire problems at hand, but also was later expanded upon again. The final thing here in terms of season five for Verdansk and that evolution wasn't necessarily so much relating to the evolution of the map, but instead of how the evolution of the game was going to take place on the map. Black Ops Cold War's worldwide reveal happened here with a live event that allowed players to watch the reveal in real time in game, which for the foreseeable future, I would imagine changes how things are revealed because when you have the opportunity to show something to such a massive audience in house, why spend that kind of budget on exterior marketing? That was season five. Modern Warfare season six, the final content season for the main year of support for Modern Warfare. It had a few things introduced here and a few things that wrapped up the sort of Modern Warfare era before jumping into some inclusion with Black Ops Cold War. Firstly, to start, there was a brand new subway station system that opened up. These connected to Vorst District, that being downtown, Verdansk train station, Verdansk Center, which is stadium, Barraket Shopping District, Lozov Pass, Verdansk International Airport, and Block. These seven locations were a fast travel system that allowed you to get from point A to point B a little quicker and maybe allowed you to get out of some sticky situations if you were pinned down by opposing gunfire. There also was a brand new Easter egg here for an eighth station that allowed you to access a manual override sequence from the Capitol building in downtown Verdansk to then allow you to end up getting to the secret and cut off eighth station of maintenance. From here, you could end up earning the Firebrand Broom blueprint and also things like the specialist token, a juggernaut suit, and all kinds of other crazy 
things like that. It made it very worthwhile. We also saw, though, in terms of the evolution of Verdansk as the season went on, in accordance with the Haunting of Verdansk event, we saw Verdansk at night, something that a lot of players were beforehand kind of worried about how this would play out for visibility, because there were already a lot of dark corners that players could camp in, but truth be told, having looked back at it, I remember seeing this very fondly received, with some players maybe even going as far as to saying this was their favorite part of Warzone that we'd had up until this point. That being something that likely returns here, but we'll talk about that in a second. And finally, when it came to Verdansk, one of the big parts here was the Warzone ending cutscene. This was accessible by completing some of the intel missions that we had seen progress throughout the last couple of months, thus kind of concluding the end of Modern Warfare story in Modern Warfare 2019. Price and 141 thwart Zakaev's plan to enact World War III by launching the ICBMs that had lied dormant underneath Verdansk for years, and at the very end of that were introduced to the one, the only, Soap McTavish. But that was season six. Then we end up seeing, fast forwarding a little bit, the Black Ops Cold War launches. About a month after that though, we end up seeing that Black Ops Cold War Season 1 brought with it a lot of stuff in regards to what we still experience to this day. Cold War's integration was the big key focal point here with this and also the introduction of Rebirth Island. Those were the two main focal points, that main attention going to the weaponry and of course a brand new map introduced here with this. Verdansk was kind of put on the side here for this and for Season 1, there really wasn't much to talk about in regards to the evolution or changes of the map. Though, before we jump over to the next season, outside of the map, there actually was a little bit of a change, because for those that were eagle-eyed, you may have noticed that there was a ship in Season 1 outside of Rebirth Island on the horizon there. That was the ship Vodianoi. But then we started to see that actually make its way over to Verdansk, outside of the map in the Southern Ocean Sea, whatever you want to call it, where it was coming closer and closer with a storm cloud over top of it, foreshadowing a little bit of what was to come. But Black Ops Cold War Season 2, that's where, again, kind of making up for some lost time in Season 1. Season 2 initially introduced quite a bit in terms of the overall changes that we saw to Verdansk, but again, if you interact with this kind of stuff for one or two days or even a couple of weeks after the launch of Season 2, it didn't quite feel like a lot. But in terms of quantity compared to other map changes and seasons, there was a lot on deck. Firstly, it closed off and sealed off a lot of locations around the map that were previously accessible in Modern Warfare's main year of support. It closed off the metro and the subway stations. Those were no longer able to be used to use that fast travel system, and you could no longer go into the subsections of that. It also closed off the lower portions of stadium. Those locker rooms and the parking structures and tunnels that went along with it, those were all closed off, and unfortunately, subsequently cut off the ability to do both of those Easter eggs for the metros, and also stadium. But on the other hand, it opened up three new bunkers and silos that would play an integral piece to the coming season ahead. We saw a new bunker underneath the runway of airport, that actually having a lot of area underneath it and a lot of room to loot up with lots of goodies in there. We saw a bunker introduced in the silo underneath the monument southwest of military and also a new bunker in the silo of the monument just south of Promenade West. Those were a bit more hidden perhaps, but the more apparent of changes was that of the shipwreck point of interest introduced here. This coming along in conjunction with Treyarch's launch of the Outbreak Zombies mode, but also then coming over to how Season 2 would wrap up. The zombies would end up eventually spreading here from point of interest to point of interest. A bit of a slow burn event, not quite exactly what a lot of people would have hoped for or expected, especially given that we saw the zombies outbreak counter in each of these silos added in that had percentages of how much is actually overtaken. But we later ended up seeing a warning system talking about the outbreak, talking about the spread and things like that, all the way up until the point of the nuke event at the very end or part one of the nuke event, because we ended up seeing here that right before the launch of Black Ops Cold War Season 3, we had an event that would be carrying over from one day to the next, in which we ended up seeing that zombies actually overran everything in this LTM. You were trying to extract, get out of Verdansk, but you weren't able to make it, and thus, Verdansk has fallen, then we saw the launch of the nuke, it hits Verdansk and blows it to Kingdom Come. And that was a direct transfer over then into Black Ops Cold War Season 3. We then end up seeing that replay again, but from the other side of the story where we're in Rebirth Island just off the coast of Verdansk, and we're the ones that actually launch the nuke. We're the ones that have to allow Verdansk to fall, and once we do, once we complete that, we actually launch into a cutscene and then drop directly into the brand new map or reimagination of Verdansk, Verdansk 84. 
This included things like new points of interest, Gora Summit, which removed Dam, Salt Mine, which removed Quarry, the Grid Radar Array, Old Mine, factory, and then there were all kinds of other different map changes like Verdansk Regional Airport with more interior space available to play with, Old Verdansk Stadium, which was entirely viable. There wasn't as much camping cover. The broadcast tower, that large skyscraper in downtown, that was under construction, though removed shortly thereafter. We saw changes to locations like Superstore and others, and something that reflected a more 80s theme here, something of the Soviet Union rather than a post-Cold War Verdansk, more vibrant and things like that. Instead, we went back in time to fit the Black Ops Cold War theme. Though shortly after, 80s action heroes, that thematic event actually offered up a little bit more in terms of changes for the map. We saw Nakatomi Plaza replace that broadcast tower, and actually, it still stands to this day. Nakatomi Plaza also being the home of the only somewhat Easter egg we've had in Verdansk since Season 6, with the ability to open the vault, gain access to things like Specialist and Advanced UAV, and tons of cash. This only being available, though, for two weeks during the 80s Action Heroes event. And for a short period of time, we actually did see one of the hangars remodeled to be a CIA bunker, and also we saw a bunch of survivor camps to fit the theme of Rambo across the map as well. Functionality-wise, we ended up seeing that with the introduction of Verdansk 84, we saw even more ladders and ascenders added to counter more rooftop play, so for those that were a little bit bummed out at the initial offering of the ascenders in the original Verdansk, this was to try and make up for that in some capacity. Though somehow devoid of any changes was ATC, both in Season 5 with the initial ascender offering and with Black Ops Cold War Season 3 and all the additional changes made to countering elevated play. Come on, Raven. And if you really want to get technical down to the nitty gritty, there actually were some cover changes in Hangar where planes were changed in their location in this season as well. But Black Ops Cold War Season 3, one of the larger updates to Verdansk that we had seen, changing a lot of the map and a lot of how it played, that kicked us off into the next couple of months of the Black Ops Cold War era. Following such a large introduction here and changeover from Verdansk and Black Ops Cold War Season 3, Season 4 was rather lackluster by comparison. We had the ground follow event and the satellites that crashed around the map subsequently offering a little bit more loot, some cover in areas where there may not have been. And in addition to that, for a short bit of time here after the launch of Season 4, about that two weeks that the event itself was actually active, we saw satellites would actually crash down with activation beacons, if you want to call them that. We could end up getting free things like a loadout drop marker for absolutely no cost instead of 10,000, or you could end up getting a harp, a subtle variation here on the advanced UAV where it didn't show ghosted players, but it lasted about twice as long. But outside of that, really wasn't all that much. Though, the red door system was introduced here, which did reintroduce that fast travel system, though not necessarily as predictable as you may have wanted a fast travel system to be. At least with the subway stations, you knew exactly where you'd be going. The red door system, there were plenty of locations you could land at, and plenty of different locations you could end up taking. These offering up a little bit in terms of rewards like cash, durable gas masks, advanced UAVs, and things like that, so they were absolutely worthwhile for a quick boost to your loot, while allowing you to get around the map a little faster, but those were introduced with Season 4. In Black Ops Cold War Season 5, there was a little bit more here, but still not so much, especially initially offered with Season 5. We first saw the big piece of marketed content was the broadcast stations. The mobile broadcast stations introduced with Season 5 were initially, well, inaccessible. You couldn't use them at all. They were kind of just there as placeholders up until the numbers event following Season 5 reloaded. Once actually active, though, they would give off the incredibly annoying broadcast sequence that would play anytime you were in the vicinity of these broadcast stations, but they were worth dropping at initially, though, because whoever activated it got $5,000 cash in Battle Royale, and that was a great way to boost your early game, allow you to get maybe a loadout a little bit quicker. There were some changes to the Red Door system, where instead of taking you initially to that landing location, they would then take you to a corridor of multiple different red doors, straight out of something like the campaign mission of Break On Through, a very trippy which one do I take sort of deal. But all in all, point A to B was instead more so point A to B to C. It all had the same outcome depending on where you landed. Now we also saw that there were red cargo crates that popped up around Verdansk that seemingly had generators inside of them and a lot of power being pulled, but we didn't have any explanation and we wouldn't get that until Season 6. But also in Season 5 
here, not quite necessarily dealing with the overall map changes itself and the evolution of the map, but instead being a part two to how we saw the use of Verdansk, we end up having another live event revealing Call of Duty Vanguard during this season as well, offering up a little bit in terms of loot rewards. And if you were to ask me, I think that that event kind of threw off the schedule of content for things like Black Ops Cold War and Base Warzone, but I guess we'll never know. And finally, Season 6, where we are currently within the Black Ops Cold War and Warzone era, gearing up for the finale of Verdansk before we jump over to Warzone Pacific. Now, with Season 6, there was a lot in terms of sort of the destruction of Verdansk once again here, in which downtown was leveled and so was the surrounding areas. There are cracks or fissures in Stadium on the hillside by Radar Array in downtown. Buildings actually in downtown collapsed. About two of the five main camper buildings here were taken out. There there still is the E apartment building where it would be in ground war for modern warfare. There's still the white hotel that was behind the broadcast station, and there's still Nakatomi Plaza, but we end up seeing the rotunda side hotel and the broadcast building taken down. So better than nothing, I guess, right? We also saw that in Verdansk, we had the World War II bunkers opened up here. Three bunkers across the map that have a lot of loot in them, but also don't really hold much outside of that. Just sort of thematically getting us ready, perhaps, to jump over to World War II, though Warzone Pacific has never actually been confirmed to be World War II just yet. So maybe just a more so thematic thing with Verdansk here. But we also see likely coming in the next couple of days, given the haunting event is coming. And if you take a look at data mined items, Verdansk at night looks to be coming once again here at this. So another and perhaps final change to Verdansk before we say goodbye to it overall is indeed coming. But that, my friends, that is the complete evolution of Verdansk. From the initial mention as a humble outskirt city in the campaign's country of Castovia, to the growth and expansion of the present-day Verdansk, the overrun of zombies which caused a nuclear detonation, to the then flashback telling the prequel story following Stitch and Adler's conflict dating back to 1984 to fit thematic ties with Black Ops Cold War. Verdansk has been through a lot. Maybe not enough, depending on who you ask, but while I'm incredibly excited to jump into something new with Warzone Pacific, this has been quite a journey over the past 19 months. I do hope that you enjoyed this retrospective look at the map that we've probably all become way too accustomed with over that time, and if you did in any way, please do me a favor, drop a like and a comment, maybe consider subscribing. This video was a labor of love and a piece of content that is outside of our sort of air quote norm for the channel, and it would mean the world to me if you enjoyed it as much as I did. So do feel free to drop a like, let me know your thoughts, and of course, if you are new, if you'd like to subscribe, I'd love to have you in the community. But that said, that's the evolution of Verdansk. Thanks so much for watching, and until next time, take care and peace.